white people. Amazing. Okay. Um, I hope you've had a good few days. I am going to be funny. I know we're going to talk about like really dark, ugly things, but I'm hilarious. I hope someone warned you. Okay. Uh, how many of you have a teenager or know a teenager? Okay. How many of you pay that teenager's cell phone bill? Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm going to make you feel better about paying those cell phone bills. Um, so Crisis Text Line is 24-7, support by text. It grew sort of from the rib of another organization. Um, DoSomething.org is the largest organization in the world, actually, for young people and social change. So it's things like um, collecting food for food pantries. Except we called all the food pantries and said, do you really need soup? Because everyone is giving you soup. And they said, no, please, no more soup. We need protein, non-perishable protein. So that's either spam or peanut butter. We went with peanut butter. And uh, the whole campaign was called the PB and Jam Slam. And the whole thing is, are you team crunchy or team smooth? So who is smooth? OK, you're right. And, and actually, two thirds of the peanut butter we collected was smooth. Um, and that was about 130,000 jars of smooth peanut butter. So you can do the math. Um, we collected a heck of a lot of peanut butter, filling the nation's food pantries in about four weeks. So uh, do something would send out a text message. That's the best way to reach young people. Those of you who raised your hand earlier, my guess is that's the only way you communicate with your young person is by text. Exactly. And so that's how Do Something reaches its more than 5 million members by text. So we would send out a text message saying, hey, do you want to do the PB and Jam Slam and help food pantries? Huge open rates. How many of you do marketing at all to young people with education or want to, do you use text messaging? Great. 97% open rate. You open every text message you get. Um, uh, it over indexes Hispanic and um, urban, uh, which is pretty exciting. Only there's this one strange side effect, which is every time we would send out a text message, we would get back a few dozen messages having nothing to do with peanut butter, crunchy, smooth, um, homelessness, hunger. Uh, but instead, and now we're going to get serious, uh, the messages would say things like, I think my best friend is addicted to crystal meth, and I don't know what to do about it. And my guess is that some of you in education marketing, if you're working directly with young people, you're probably getting some of this content also. Um, we've been hearing from tutoring organizations and, and, and organizations that work with young people saying, we don't know what to do with this content. And we did what I suspect some of you do, which is we triaged it. Here is a hotline number. Go talk to your principal. Um, maybe you should talk to your mom about that. And then we got a message from a girl that uh, literally said, he won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. And then the letters, are you there? Which was just a whole other level. And we, we gave her the hotline number um, for uh, RAIN, which is the Rape and Incest Organization. And I came in the next day and said, what happened? Did we hear from her? Didn't hear from her. Sent it to her again. And the truth is, we've never heard back from her. I actually have tried reaching out to her personally. I've never heard back to her. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's dead or alive. Um, I don't know if he saw that message. And so we realized we needed to start something um, to help people, that if they wanted to communicate these very intimate, very serious things by text, there needed to be a text hotline in this country to do it. So in August 2013, we launched Crisis Text Line very quietly. Now, those of you who are interested in tech growth will appreciate these numbers. We pulled 4,000 mobile numbers uh, from the Do Something database in Chicago and 4,000 mobile numbers from the database in El Paso. And we sent them a message that said, hey, there's this new text line that's just started to help people in crisis. If you're interested, here's the number. And so they had to re-opt in. And in four months, we were in all 295 area codes in the United States. Um, so that's faster uh, geographic growth than when Facebook first launched. I mean, that's just massive um, growth throughout the United States. Um, I really thought it was going to be all teenagers and all messages about bullying. 22% of our messages are about suicide and depression. The next 18% are about anxiety. And after that, it's family issues. 
Um, and now, less than three years later, we've processed over 16.1 million messages. All organic growth, all word of mouth. Um, also, uh, given the makeup of the room, I'll also share with you that about 30 to 35 percent of our texters are not young people, are not teenagers at all. In fact, they're people texting in about their own issues, uh, their own divorce, their own fear over losing a house, their own marital, marital problems, uh, and uh, drug abuse. Um, it's fascinating. Turns out text is a fantastic way to counsel people. You just get facts. You don't get the words like, um, you don't get hyperventilating, you don't get crying, you don't get repetition. It's incredibly effective. They can uh, keep the message if they want and hold on to it and go back and look at it later. We spike every day during lunchtime. You think that that girl at your lunch table is texting the boy across the cafeteria, but actually she's texting us about her anxiety over her calculus exam that afternoon. And nobody around her knows. She's just quietly texting us. Sometimes people are texting us while being bullied. The kid next to me is saying such and such, I'm being pressured, blah, 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 and they're texting us. We get messages like, um, I want to die, and uh, we go through a whole risk assessment. That's the very first words that come in, I want to die. And we go through a risk assessment, is this serious, is this a prank? No, this is serious. They have the ideation to kill themselves. And the next thing we do is, do they have a plan? Yes, they plan on taking pills. And then we see if they have the means and the timing, and it turns out the pills are on the desk in front of them while we're texting. And so our crisis counselors will say, hey, why don't you put the pills in the desk drawer while we text back and forth? And our crisis counselor will then do something called an active rescue and contact 911. And most of the time, the texter will tell us where he or she is because you've contacted a text line. You want help. Sometimes they won't tell us where they are. And then we work with the mobile carriers and the police, and we can triangulate and find someone. In this instance, she told us where she was, but then the, the messages went silent for 23 minutes, 23 very long minutes. And the next message that came in was, this is the mom. I was in the house. I had no idea. And we're in an ambulance on our way to the hospital, which as a parent might be I mean, the worst thing I could ever imagine. And a month later, though, from that same account, a text message comes in that says, I just got out of the hospital, I was diagnosed as bipolar, and I'm going to be OK, which is pretty amazing. Um, the crazy thing about that story is that's now happening about eight times a day. We are triggering an active rescue and having to call police or EMT to go to someone's home eight times a day. So you didn't come to this session for me to horrify you and tell you um, how Crisis Text Line works and about these mental health situations. You came because the promise was I was going to tell you about big data and social good. So here's the best part about Crisis Text Line. Because it's all text, because it's all words, we're using AI and natural language processes to auto-tag all the words in real time. And so we're now sitting on the largest mental health data set that's ever been collected. And we use it to make us better, and we use it to make the world better. And this is why this is applicable in an ed tech world. So we use it to make us better in a few ways. One is we triage. This should function more like a hospital emergency room than most of the customer service we're used to. Right? If you text in that you want to die, you should be taken first in a queue. And that's what we do. I, I frankly wish the airlines would handle me this way. My flight is in an hour. Please don't put me on hold. Let like the family that's planning you know, Thanksgiving wait for 40 minutes while you help me. Um, all customer service should work this way. It should be triaged. So if you text in, I want to die, I want to kill myself, the algorithm reads that and makes you number one in the queue. About 10 months ago, the machine learning in our algorithm figured out Things like hashtag KMS. I had a really bad day, hashtag KMS. And that was made number one in the queue. KMS apparently stands for kill myself. The algorithm, even though we're an English only service, the algorithm reads other languages. So if you text in quiero morir, you're number one in the queue. And that's how this stuff should work. Um, we've also realized we've uh, layered on a bag of words algorithm, a little naive Bayes algorithm, um, to do some light predictive work. So we know that if you text in certain words, there's a serious likelihood that you're experiencing certain things. Essentially bringing science for the first time ever to counseling. Um, 
So if you text in the words trembling and doom, we know there's a 90 plus percent match for something. Can you guess what that issue is? Trembling and doom. Okay, that was the easy one. That was anxiety, exactly. That one's easy, they're about to get harder. Okay, um, numbs and sleeve, 90% match for something. Cutting, exactly, self-harm. Um, MG and rubber band. MG is an abbreviation for something, for milligram. Okay, um, that's substance abuse. Um, assumes and unfit. That's family violence. He's an unfit parent. He assumes he knows everything. So think about, uh, think about that. You, if I had given you more time, you probably would have guessed what those issues were. But the algorithm is faster and more accurate than you are. The algorithm will be faster and more accurate than Sigmund Freud would be if he was reading our text messages. Um, that's just what this stuff is. It's kind of like the calculator making me better at long division. It's not replacing me, it just makes me a heck of a lot faster and a heck of a lot more accurate. And that's what technology is there for, we believe. We don't think it's there to replace us, we think it's there to make us better. Um, so imagine now all the products that we can layer on top of this algorithm. So it reads a 90 plus percent match for substance abuse. Now we can layer on a pop-up for our crisis counselors that say, here are the nearest drug clinics to your texture. Um, the algorithm reads a 90 percent plus match for uh, cutting. Now we can pop up words and we can say try using these words because these words are the most effective in taking someone from a hot moment to a cool moment. And I can tell you what those words are, by the way. I can tell you that the best words that you can use with your teenagers or with your spouse or with your coworker or with anyone who's in a hot moment and needs to get to a cool moment, there are three magic words. Smart, proud, and brave. And that's because we're using science to analyze counseling. Think about this for a second. You don't have to raise your hand, but somebody in this room has at some point in time seen a marriage counselor or a shrink or like a coach. Um, you don't have to out yourself, I'll just out myself. So um, my husband and I, we're good now, but my husband and I at one point in time went to see a marriage counselor and um, we had this first session. At the end of the session, she looked at us and said, okay guys, I'll see you both in two weeks, but Jason, I need to see you alone next week. And I was like, oh my God, she's a genius. She's so good, she knows you're the problem. This is great. <laughs> this is a really good, this is a really good marriage counselor. Um, how do you know your marriage counselor is any good? What, they, like, they went to Harvard? Or um, you know, they're like 80 years old and smoke a pipe and you're impressed by that? Uh, how do you know that these people are any good? You, you don't. Somebody had to graduate in the bottom 10% of the class from Harvard. Maybe that was your marriage counselor. Um, we know what makes a counselor great. We can look at um, all of our uh, dashboards and we can see that it takes our counselors, say, a minute to respond to every issue, but when you're dealing with an eating disorders issue, it takes you two minutes to respond. Maybe you've got some kind of a latent issue going on there. Um, we do know those words that take people from hot to cool. Um, we know what makes a crisis counselor great. And what we've decided to do is take all of that and open it up and make the world better. Not just us as an organization, but we hope help the mental health space more generally. So in two ways we've done this. One is we opened up aggregate data. If you go to crisistrends.org, it's actually appropriate that I followed the Google dude because we were inspired by Google's flu trends. So if you go to crisistrends.org, you will be able to see all kinds of things like the worst time of day for substance abuse, by far the worst time of day for substance abuse. Can you take a guess? Anyone wanna guess when that is? 5 a.m., like by far. Or the worst day of the week for eating disorders? Sunday. Sunday is the worst day of the week for eating disorders. Or a place that is beautiful to live but has the highest suicidal ideation, so maybe visit but don't live there? Montana, like always, number one, suicidal ideation. Think about why this matters. This matters because I always assumed eating disorders were a teen girl bullying type thing at school. No, this is a family thing. This is something that happens on Sundays. And if you have a family with acute issues, or if you run a hospital or an intake center, you need to know that information. If you run a dorm, or a church, 
or any kind of program that comes in contact with people with substance abuse, you need to know that 5 a.m. is peak time. And something funny is going on in Montana and they should pay attention to that. Aggregate data, it really matters. Um, and then what we realized is because we were sitting on this giant mental health data set, that researchers really needed access to it. So we decided to open up Enclave data for non-commercial use. Um, we announced this in mid-February. We created our own IRB process and an ethics committee. And I will tell you, the deadline was March 31st. We had more than 65 academics complete the application, which is bonkers because it's like a four-hour application. And we're seriously considering 15 of them. And there are things like Ryerson College in Canada wants to look at LGBTQ texts and compare them to hate crimes and see what's going on. The Department of Transportation reached out to us and said, can you please help us understand these railway suicides in the Bay Area, in Palo Alto, by those young people? And we said, absolutely. Um, and so there are a couple of things that uh, we'll be sharing with them. One is we'll be sharing with them all the suicidal ideation uh, data. Two is we'll be sharing all the data um, from, um, that moves, that where the GPS location changes. And the third thing we can share with them is that there is something that's strange about what's going on in Palo Alto versus the rest of the country. That in the rest of the country, there are two words that always come up as top with suicidal ideation, and they're usually one and two, friends in school. Um, and the third word kind of changes, but that third word is number one in the Bay Area. And that third word is mom. I think that this kind of information is super important because it's going to save lives. I think this kind of information is super important because it's going to make our, our organization better. But what I'm most proud of from Crisis Text Line is that I think the model of taking this large data set, collecting, storing, and analyzing it in a clean way, and then sharing it, all the PI, all the personally identifiable information, all the PII protected, but sharing it is going to not only save those lives, but hopefully model this behavior. All of you are sitting on juicy data sets. All of you are sitting on juicy data sets. How could those data sets be monetized? I'm sure you're all thinking of. But my request is that you also think about how those data sets could be used in an open and free way to make the world better. Okay, I'm open for questions. Let's do this. No one has any questions? You have a question? <laughs> if no one has any questions, everyone can go take a nap because you look fried. Go ahead, what's your question? You know, it's, um, it's not up to me to explain why substance abuse is 5 a.m. or Montana or any of these data points. We really see ourselves as um, shining light on a place that's dark. Um, this data hasn't existed before us, and we're hoping that researchers and journalists and policymakers can take it and make sense of it. Um, I don't know, but I'm glad I live in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so in measuring the effectiveness of a crisis counselor, we have both implicit and explicit ways of, um, of looking at things, right? Everyone does. So um, there are all kinds of explicit things like we can survey textures. Was this conversation helpful, Y or N? Um, then we can push them a, another survey, a link that they can go to somewhere else. And so that's all explicit data. Then we have implicit data. Um, we can scrape things like emojis. We know that 65% of our conversations contain emojis, um, textures sending emojis, and that emojis can shift in a conversation from hot to cool. If you're starting the conversation with really frustrated emojis, and at the end of the conversation, you're sending kissy faces and smiley faces and ice cream cones to your crisis counselor, you feel better. Um, we know that over 55% of our conversations unsolicited contain the word thanks in those last 10 messages. Um, gratitude. Uh, unrequested. So we can scrape all of those things. It's, it's pretty exciting. Yes? You said there were three cool down words, proud, brave. Uh, and smart. Smart. How do you use those? Do you describe the person? And you give me an example. So this is what's really interesting. There have been, for decades, assumptions made largely, um, you know, academic research, 
um, on how you should counsel someone in a crisis, um, the kinds of words you should use, how that conversation should go, and now we're able to look at what actually works. So we know that when you use smart, proud, or brave, not as I think that was really smart, but you made a smart decision, you should feel really proud of yourself, um, you made a brave choice, that's really powerful. We also tested things like formal speech versus informal speech. Um, we're typically all told in a situation like this to say, hey, um, uh, not to use contractions, um, to use very formal speech and proper spelling. Turns out that it's far more human, relatable, and engenders trust. If you throw in a couple of misspellings and um, put in some, um, some more familiar words. Uh, in, and the last one that we've tested is um, I statements. In counseling, you're taught never to put yourself in this situation. I understand, I had that happen to a friend once. Turns out, way more popular if you sprinkle that in. Um, we do, I will say, every once in a while, uh, have people text and say, are you a bot? I know that's a, a hot subject here, and anybody who was at F8 or watching the news coming out of F8 last week realizes that bots are you know, all the rage. Um, and I would just say that while we could, we absolutely could, we have a large enough, we've got the volume, velocity, and variety in this data corpus to do enough predictive work, and there are patterns there where we could actually counsel people just via AI, or at least a whole lot of it be handled that way. We've decided to be human first. So all of these lessons on what's effective, we've decided should be used to make human beings better, not to replace us. I watch the Terminator movies. I, I'm not interested in Skynet. How many counselors do you have? Right now we have about 1,500 counselors around the United States, and we'd like to be at 3,000 by the end of the year. And um, we think that should be more like 4,500 the end of next year. Um, it's a lot. But there's a lot of pain out there. We're at the bottom of the mountain. You gotta, uh, can, uh, of the texters or of the crisis counselors? Um, it's actually pretty fascinating. Uh, 6% men, or 6% identified as male. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an organization about empathy. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I would love, we would love more men, more men with, who are interested in, in counseling people who are texting about all these things, really. We, we love men. Um, we just don't have as many of them as we have women. How do you collect your data? And, and if it's the text that gets uh, analyzed, how do you deal with privacy? Um, privacy, um, privacy is super important to us. Uh, first of all, by texting in, it, you no know, one overhears you. Um, we made sure, actually Richard Branson sent an email on our behalf to the four major mobile carriers and asked them to waive our fees, to waive texture fees, and more importantly, to pull us from bills, um, which was unheard of. Mobile carriers hadn't done that before. And um, I think, you know, people open email from Richard Branson. And so within hours, actually, I'll be honest, within hours, three of the four of them said yes. And then the fourth one was like, how do we get in on this? Um, anyway. Uh, so we don't even appear in people's bills, um, well, which is great because you never know who's gonna, who, who pays for that bill. Also, you can scrub yourself completely from our system anytime you want. All you have to do is text in the word loofah, including misspellings, and we scrub you. Um, and it's automated. Um, it's not even reviewed. We're short code. We're short code based. It's 741741. It makes a line up the phone. Crisis text line, yes, um, which is challenging because there are a couple of sort of edge case um, mobile carriers in the United States that have not um, switched on um, short codes, which is a little bit frustrating. Um, so we're working on it, but um, yeah, it's short code based. Yep. We are, I will say, in the API for the, we're in the beta rather for the messenger API, and um, we're pretty excited about that. Um, uh, doing, um, crisis counseling via messenger and um, is going to be really exciting, although there's rich media uh, is much more common over messenger than it is even by text. And so it, it, there are all kinds of other interesting and exciting things that we're going to have to navigate with that. But we're really excited to switch that on. Yep. 
No, the counselors are on desktops. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, we have some autocorrect um, that we've built in this, into the platform. Um, the crisis counselors, here's one of the things that we realized, and I suspect a, a lot of you have realized this as ed tech companies. We really thought that we were building this for texters. Um, that was our goal, right, is to help people in pain. And what we quickly realized is that their use case is natural. It's just texting. That actually what we were doing was building this for those crisis counselors, for those 1,500 crisis counselors. And that was actually our customer, if you will. Um, and that's who we're building for. And so we went out and we looked. And we realized that what's really hard for crisis counselors is um, the difficulty of being isolated. And so um, we built this to look a lot like Gmail, a lot like Facebook, where there's chat functionality. So crisis counselors can actually talk to each other. And they can look at the same thread, the same conversation. Transfer can be seamless. So if someone needs a bathroom break or someone's shift ends, you can be uh, transferred seamlessly. Again, I wish all customer service works this way. Um, instead of having to re-enter my Amex number every time I get transferred. Um, I think I have time, I've got time, these two questions, okay, these two questions and I'll do them at the same time. So go ahead and ask them and I'm gonna combine them like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and I will tell you a really creepy story. Go ahead, yep. Um, the platform itself, is it, some of it is open source. You can see us on GitHub. Um, we are a little bit Drupal, so we love open source. Um, a little bit PHP and a little bit of everything. It's kind of bubble, gub, gub, bubble gum and duct tape because it's still early days. We're a startup. Um, I will tell you a creepy story and leave you on that note because I'm already out of time. Um, Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Eve, we got a message from someone. The starting message said, I want to kill people. Not a prank. Um, the message thread, I only feel pleasure when I'm inflicting pain. I keep mementos. I know these feelings are wrong. Please stop me. I have social anxiety, so I'm not going to walk into a police station or call anyone. Um, please. So we send the police, and the police arrive at this person's home and find an arsenal of loaded guns and a foot. Not like, like a human foot. Um, those crisis counselors have just experienced something really traumatic. On our platform are also paid supervisors. They have master's degrees, and they are there to help. We do debriefing. But um, this is not for the faint of heart, which might be why our crisis counselors are 94% female. <laughs> I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much.